Welcome to our Shepherd's Chapel Bible Study. It's so great that you could all join us today. Please join us in prayer. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. Father, our cups truly do runneth over, and we owe it all to you. We honor you and, and thank you for the Passover that we have just had, but as we remember all that you have done for us and continue to do for us, we honor you this day and every day, Father, and we thank you for all that you do. Even in this time of sinuses and coughs, and <coughs> we all, sounds like a little hospital in here from time to time, we know that you're still in charge, Father. And that as these bodies, these flesh bodies, have to endure the things of this world right now, we know, dear Lord, that there's a better place, a better time, a better season for each and every one of us. And we pray, Father, for each and every one of us that we stay focused in doing your work. Also, before you at this time, Father, we have these unspoken prayers. We, we bring them before you, knowing that you hear every, every single prayer. And you answer every single prayer in perfect season. And we thank you for each and every one. Also, Father, before you, we pray for Donna, Faye, Jody, Pastor Murray, and Shane. And all these, Father, we ask that you lead, that you guide, that you direct, that you touch, and that you heal in Yahshua's precious holy name. And also, Father, we pray for all those who have come and gone from our chapel, wherever they are, whatever they are doing. We pray for their safety and speedy return to the sheepfold, that they have not forsaken thy word, Father. And as well, we pray for Israel and for our nation, knowing that it will be thy kingdom that will come, Father. This is what we long for and we prepare ourselves for. And that we await for your true coming. And we pray for those first responders every day that are on the front lines helping your children. As well as our military who are in arms way. Or who are about to go into arms way for their safety and speedy return home. Now Father we also pray for the lost. Those that do not have an opportunity to receive thy truth this day. And we pray, dear Lord, for those that have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Because without you, without accepting the Lord Jesus Christ, they cannot receive the fullness of thy word. And we pray, dear Lord, that they will accept Jesus, that they will repent of their sins this day and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior this day so that they may receive the fullness of thy word. Now, Father, I pray that you open up our eyes that we may see. I pray that you open up our ears that we may hear thy words as it is written, as it will be you that speaks to us this day. In Yahshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, getting back into our Father's word. Uh, uh, to start with, I want to uh, thank all of you that uh, uh, indulged and partook of and honored our Lord and Savior on the Passover. It's very important. There's so many people today that use it just as a holiday or don't use it at all. Don't acknowledge our Christ and, and the price that he paid for our sins. It wasn't for his sins. He had never sinned. But he paid that price. And he hung on that cross. And he took the stripes. And he gave a, of his blood for each and every one of us. And I thank you for honoring him on his Passover. Now getting back into our, our series, we are in the what's called the real beginning, the truth about the beginning, part four. Uh, we're not going to be going through the entire book of Genesis. Uh, there's something that needs to be uh, taught today. And... Um, either next lecture or the lecture afterwards uh, of, of certain things in Genesis that need to be taught before we go back to our, our studies where we were before. But 
We completed before Passover in Genesis chapter 2 verse 6 telling us after God created the earth and all his creation, he, it says he rested on the seventh day. But as we see in chapter 2 verse 5, it says there that there was not a man to till the ground. Now, this is after God's six-day creation. Verse 7, as we will begin today, starts a new subject. Not the six-day created man, but an eighth-day formed man. But before we begin in Genesis, I have a question, or better said, when, when I learn this from our Father, it's not where I questioned Him. I was questioning my understanding of it all, and, and which we haven't gotten to yet, but the Garden of Eden and all, which we'll get into today. But it says that our Father created the Garden of Eden, but this was after the six-day creation, after he rested on the seventh. But, but we read in the very beginning of chapter 2 that in verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all the host of them. Now at that point, people have a tendency of believing, well, God was done. He was done with creating everything that he was going to create. And I can understand their understanding of that, but I was having difficulty too. What I mean by this, let me give you an example, is that when I was asking God about this, I said, well, Lord, you, you created all your creation, and you rested on the seventh, but then you bring the Garden of Eden in, and, and this man Adam, which we'll get into today, well, why, and you brought in Christ and Satan, which we'll get into today, in the garden. Well, why did you have a special place for that? Why not put it with all your other creation? Because after all, it was for their benefit to be able to receive this information. Or another question I have, well, how were they going to receive all this information that you have for them? Because they, you didn't have the written word at that point. So how was everyone supposed to get to the knowledge and understanding of who and what you are? So these are the kind of questions I was asking God. And, and guess what? God answered my questions. Now, what I'm about to teach you today, uh, to some degree, not all of it, but to some degree... I cannot tell you that it is written verbatim in the Word of God. As a matter of fact, to my knowledge, I am the only one that teaches this. Even my mentor, Dr. Murray, uh, didn't teach this this way. He taught it a different way. So I want you to hear, I want you to question, and I want you to understand. And I and by the glory and, and, and the praise of God, I, I pray that you will understand what is being spoken today fully so you can reap the rewards as I have done. So, again, we're talking about the eighth day formed man. Now, my, a question I do also have is, does the eighth day have any significance in God's Word? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, because it does. And now, we're not going to go there, and, and I want you to write these down, if you would, and go and do your own study. But in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 33, is the culmination of all the holy days, following the description of the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles. <coughs> Excuse me. Now it says there, Also on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in 
<coughs> excuse me, the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day a Sabbath rest. Interesting. On the eighth day it says. You see, the eighth day is separate and distinct from the Feast of Tabernacles. God has placed symbolic meaning in counting up to the number eight. Now, another question I have, well, why not just start over? I mean, once you hit seven, which is spiritual completeness, why not start over to number one? Why is there an eighth introduced? Because our Father uses the number eight to symbolize something of great importance. He also, he will symbolize, as we'll see in just a moment, of being righteous. In Genesis chapter 17, verses 10 and 11, he said, He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Well, we all know what circumcision is. Now, why did God want this done on the eighth day? Why not the seventh? Or you say, well, that's the seventh. All right, well, why not the sixth? Or why not the ninth or the tenth? He specifically wanted things to be done of circumcision on the eighth day. Being circumcised on the eighth day was symbolic of being in complete submission to God. So today we understand this to be circumcision of the heart to God. Now, what do we do today on the eighth day? Well, what our Shepherd's Chapel has been doing for quite some time, on the eighth day after a child is born, whether it be male or female, they are dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ on that eighth day, which uh, gives them an opportunity. Of course, they're just infants, but it opens the door for not only the child, but also the family to raise the child in the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ which gives that child, once they accept the Lord Jesus Christ, an opportunity to become righteous and do what is right before God. Now, another example of this number eight we can find in, with Noah. In the book of Peter, chapter 2, verse 5. And in Peter, chapter 2, verse 5, it says, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. So that documents to us there, being of the eighth day, dictates of a righteous person. At least... We know there was at least seven others. I mean, going out, coming out the gate, we know that mankind was the beasts were also on the ark, but different subject for a different time. But we do know that there were seven other <coughs> Adamic souls on that ark with Noah. But none of them, all, none of the seven were called righteous. Only Noah was called righteous. Because he was of the eighth day lineage. Now, we have a tendency to always look at the number seven, like Christ's return on the seventh trump, the seventh seal, and the seventh vial. And that is incredibly important. But, it's pretty clear seven days to cleanse seven days to consecrate, seven days to prepare, which God did all of these. He rested on the seventh day. But it will be God, our eternal Father, who brings his eternal throne in on the eighth day. So, 
with that being said, excuse me, tis spring, tis sinus problems. So, why am I spending so much time on the idea of this eighth day? Because after God created man, created man and woman on the sixth day, he rested, as it is written, on the seventh day. And now, God needed someone on this eighth day to be righteous. Well, why? Well, think about it. If one day with the uh, Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, and God rested on that seventh day, what was happening on the, the sixth day creation? Well, they were still living and giving births and, 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 and going on for a thousand years. And then on the seventh, they went another thousand years. If you're looking at it through God's time frame, even though with God it's hard to describe time because with God there is no time. But be that as it may. So now we come, what I teach, to understand being the eighth day. So you've had creation going on now, peoples, men and women, and children coming forth, because you said be fruitful and multiply, remember, for 2,000 years. So now God is saying something here. We, we needed someone special to, to till... His creation, meaning what? To spiritually cultivate his six-day creation. You say, well, that's, that's what God is for. That's what Christ is for, which is true. But, but if a peoples are not holy, if they are not righteous, they need to have someone lead them to righteousness. Makes sense, right? So, to have a righteous person lead people to Christ and not to Satan. That's why, this is why in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, it is, is written the way it is. So with that being said, with that groundwork being laid out, we come to chapter 2 verse 7. Now listen to these words. Chapter 7 it starts off with and. Well, guess what? In the manuscripts, there is no and. Because and would dictate that it's a continuation. But this isn't a continuation. This is a new subject. This word and was not written in the manuscripts. You say, well, why is it here in my King James Bible? We could go into that, and we've gone into it in the past, but... It's neither here nor there for our learning today. But I want you to understand this word and is not in the original manuscripts. It was placed in here after the English translation was formed. So it actually says in the manuscript verse 7. And that's another thing. There is no chapter and verse in the manuscripts. It's book after book after book. And it is... Uh, uh, discernment of God how you uh, understand book after book after book again different subject for a different time but verse 7 reads in the manuscript the Lord God formed man and this word man is written a little differently listen the Lord God formed that's uh, yetzar, that means fashion, man, of the dust of the ground. And this is important, extremely important. Breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul, being in the Septuagint, Nefesh, meaning uh, in life. Now, many feel this is going back to the sixth day creation. Not so, beloved. This is a new subject. Well, but this was not a created man. 
this was a formed man. Well, people say, well, what's the difference? Well, you see, Adam, I'll give you a little English lesson there if you don't understand it. Hadam, or Adam, without the article, as it was written in chapter 1, verse 27, means man or mankind. Here, in chapter 2, verse 7, in the original manuscripts, it has the article. In the manuscript, it reads, Ha Adam, or the Adam, <coughs> meaning the man Adam. So you see, it's not that we have two individuals called Adam. We have a creation called Adam, and we have a formed particular one man called Adam, or better said, the man Adam, F. Ha Adam. But also in the manuscript, this Ha Adam, like I said, is written F. Ha Adam, which emphatically denotes the man Adam is separate from all of mankind. That's why he's not out with the six-day creation. He's separated from all of them and in the garden, the garden of God, or as we know, the garden of Eden. Now let's go deeper about this man that God formed. Our Father, it says, breathed the breath of life. In Hebrew, this is is pronounced is Neshmachayim. And we understand it in translated English as Ruach. Ruach. Meaning God's Holy Spirit. You see, the six day created man and woman did not have God's Holy Spirit. Only this one particular man formed on the eighth day, which we have already looked at about the eighth day, would be a righteous man coming out the gate because God breathed the Holy Spirit of life into this the man Adam. Now why? Why have this one particular man, Adam, have the Holy Spirit and not the rest of them? Because the rest of them needed the Holy Spirit. The rest of them needed Christ. The rest of them needed knowledge. And God was going to use this man, Adam, to teach mankind. Why do you think our Father placed the man Adam separate from the rest of mankind? He was purposely set away from them. And why do you think our Father placed the tree of knowledge of good and evil, who was Satan, in that garden, and the tree of life, who was Christ, in the garden? Why not put them out there with the other masses of people of six-day creation? Why have them in one particular location? Because our Father wanted people to come there to receive understanding. Instead of uh, Because our Father wanted someone, it, it says, to till or cultivate. And, and, and that goes, you say, well, that... My, my mentor says, well, God wanted a farmer. That's why he created Adam. And I can understand his, his teaching of that, but I've been taught that by our Father at a deeper level. To cultivate, to till. To harvest. To, not to harvest. No. Harvesting is God's department. Mm -hmm. That's at the end. You know, he does the harvesting. Mm -hmm but is to prepare mankind to receive the fullness of God. God's too holy to deal directly with mankind. That's why he was separate in the garden. 
God didn't walk to and fro in the six-day creation, did he? He walked to and fro. I mean, he did originally before flesh man came into existence. But he didn't walk to and fro in the earth or on the earth, only in the garden at this particular time. Because man is unholy. Flesh man, flesh woman, is unholy. You're unholy unless God himself, being through Christ Jesus today, breathes life into you, breathes that Holy Spirit, the Ruach, into you. And you become a saved Christian. And if you study the lineage of Christ, you find through the man Adam, F. Ha Adam, can you give me a tissue, please? <laughs> oh, excuse me. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Ah, oh, sinus. If you study the lineage of Christ, you find that through the man Adam, F. Ha Adam, there are seventy-six generations that were from umbilical cord to umbilical cord to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in flesh. Or as flesh man. Through the lineage, through the lineage, not of the sixth day creation, but through the lineage of this eighth day formed man, Eth Ha'adam, the righteous, not Adam, the unrighteous, but through Ephha Adam was the lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he's separated from all others. Now, we can debate till the cows come home whether or not this was on the sixth day or the eighth day. But with what I have been given to give you about the significance of of the eighth day and the great significance of the man righteous Adam I'm not going to say any more about it because if you do not understand this at this point it will be up to God and God alone to reveal it to you this is what I have been given to give to you this day and it is up to you to do your own research to do your own study to do your own prayer and ask God to reveal it to you. So, now we come to verse 8. Now this is after God formed Ephha Adam. This is after God placed his Holy Spirit in Ephha Adam. And verse 8 says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward, in Eden. And there he put the man, that's F. Ha Adam, whom he had formed, not created. He didn't bring the six day creation into this. He brought only one individual into this. Why? Why do you think? Because he wanted the man Adam. <coughs> Because, see, at this point, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil has not been introduced yet to mankind. But it's going to be. Listen, verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree. Now, we're going to get more deeply involved into this word tree. Not, not today's lecture. I don't believe, no, not today's lecture. But it's important. I mean, even in medical terms, and I'll touch on this very quickly, even in medical terms today, the human body is, is looked at and described like a tree. You've got the trunk of the body. You've got the limbs of the body, you know, roots. You know, how if, if you look... If you really look at how it comes from the spine and goes up into the brain and branches out, it looks just like a tree, looking at a tree outside with the branches and the, and the stems going out. 
but like I said, we'll we'll get into this at a later date because it's fascinating and it's it's really important to understand to get the fullness of God's word. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Different kinds of trees. Hear this. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You see, the trees for food, like in verse 29, well, that's the six-day creation. Not so, beloved. Not so at all. We're on the eighth day here. There was no Eden in the six-day creation. This is on the eighth day after God rested on the seventh. Now, we're going to get, like I said, into understanding of these trees in, in the Hebrew next lecture. But for now, the good trees that are for food, like our fruit trees, like our apples and oranges and plums and, and cherry trees and all these things, um, in the Hebrew... It's called ets. Those are fruit trees. Okay. Is some uh, is the same today as when God created them in the original beginning. Except they were a lot cleaner back then, and not hybrid this and that and the other. But the tree of life. I mean, tell me what tree can you go to right now? A physical tree and pick a leaf off of it or a fruit off of it and have eternal life. I mean, let's 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 open our minds here. Let's think a little bit. The tree of life is a different subject altogether. It's not a physical planted tree. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is also of a different type. How, how eating off a fruit tree is it going to give you knowledge of good and evil? It might give you some knowledge of maybe you shouldn't eat that because it's sour or something like that. But, A, one tree is not going to give you eternal life, and the other tree is not going to give you knowledge of good and evil. Can we all agree with that? Of course. So, we have come to learn, and we have come to study over the years, that the tree of life, of course, is who? Oh, Christ. Jesus Christ. <coughs> We have come to know and we have studied and with knowledge that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is Satan. Satan. So, in the midst of the garden, you've got Christ. And in the midst of the garden, you've got Satan. Well, after what Satan pulled in that first earth, first heaven age, why in the world would God want... Satan to be around at all. Well, there was a reason. And and well, let me come out with this. Why would God call Satan good at all? The knowledge of good and evil. Well, we can we can understand the evil part because you pull a third of God's children from it. But why good? Because at one point, Satan was good. That's why he was promoted to the guardian cherub over the mercy seat. There was a point that Satan, or Lucifer at that time, was considered good by God. So he was good. He did good things. He, he did righteous things before God. But he became evil. That's why he has the knowledge of good and evil. He became evil. That's why our Father calls him here good and evil. Again, we'll, we'll cover the translation of trees in the next lecture. Verse 10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. Now remember, back in those days, there was no rain. No rain at all. It, it came from the ground. It came. It came from 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 the moisture, the water table under the ground, and also what God created as oceans and rivers. 
And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Outside the garden it separated into four rivers. It was flowed, it also flowed into four lands that are named. Well, how could there be four lands named if there was only one Adam? See, there are many people living at this particular point in time in the lands from the six-day creation. Remember that. Verse 11. <clears throat> the name of the first is Pison. That is, it which compasseth or surrounds the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. You know, well, you can find gold there. Now, why is this, this, this land named, why is there a land at all named Havilah if, if there's only the Garden of Eden? See, See, if you understand God's word and, and you look at it with through God's eyes, you can understand there's a lot more going on other than just the Garden of Eden at this particular time. So this river is coming out and, it, and it's, it's going, this one particular river is going through there. In verse 12, and the goal of that land is good. There is bdellium and the onyx stone. Different stones for different um, uses. Yes, man was using stones back then. Well, I thought there was only... See, if you keep going back to only one guy, you're going to miss out because all of creation has been created. All the races have been created. There's all kinds of things being done at this particular time. Listen to verse 13. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth or surrounds the whole land of Ethiopia. <coughs> now I think we can understand the geographical location a little bit now where it says the word Ethiopia. Actually, what the land was called back then was Cush. But we can understand Ethiopia today to some degree. Many people that feel that the Garden of Eden was located on uh, uh, at the origin of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. Well, this, listen to this next verse. It might, might declare that to you. Verse 14. And the name of the third river is, is Hiddekel. Now, that actually means translated Tigris, which is still named today. That is which goeth toward the east of Assyria, or back then it was called Ashner. But even today, Assyria, you know where that geographical location is located. And the fourth river is Euphrates. So, this does give us kind of a geographical location, if you look on a map of today, really somewhere in the vicinity where the Garden of Eden was originally located. Now, some have a tendency to believe, and I believe this as well, that part of that was about 35 miles south of Jerusalem. But I can't, I can't proclaim that because it doesn't show it on any map. It's just, it's just a, uh, let's say, an educated guess that I have at this point. Now, on our today's map, if you look this up, the origins of, of especially the Tigris and Euphrates, at this particular time on our map, it's between Turkey and Armenia of today. Does that matter? No, not really. It's, it's, it's just food for thought. Verse 15. And the Lord God took the man, this is F. Ha'adam took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to 
Do what? Dress it and to keep it. Now, here's a question I have, because a lot of people say, well, see, this, the, 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 uh, the Lord wanted a farmer. This is the Garden of God, right? The Garden of Eden. Now, let's just picture this for a moment. Everything in this garden is perfect. Everything is provided for, right? Why does it need a farmer in that garden? As what we consider a farmer. Why does he, he need someone to, to, to till the ground and all that if, if everything's already growing? See, it was already created by God to be perfect. It was the garden of God, not the garden of mankind, but the garden of God, the garden of Eden. This is basically, if you will, God's kingdom on earth in this particular one little spot. Because where is the kingdom of God? Wherever God is, that's his kingdom. He's our king, we are his dominion. At this particular time, Eth-Hadam was his dominion. So, God took the man, the man Adam, not mankind, the formed man, from the eighth day, a righteous man, and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. What did God do with his temple when he had all these other priests come into the temple? What was their function to do in the temple of God? To look pretty? Did they all have functions to do mm -hmm. in the temple? Well, what was the purpose of all those functions, ultimately? What was the purpose of all that they did? To serve, God. to serve God, but also to serve all those that came to the temple. So what did they do? They prepared everything in the temple. Now, could God just sit there on his throne and, and just miraculously prepare everything? Of course he could. But that's not how he works. He wants a person's love. He wants a person to serve him, to love him. Well, the priests of the temple served him and loved him. They were supposed to. That was the whole point of it all. But they also prepared for everyone to come to the temple to receive the blessings of God. Well, this is no different here. Adam is being formed by God, having the breath of life, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach, breathed into him, to be a righteous person, to be a righteous man for God, to, to, for God to use him for the six-day creation of man to come to the Garden of God. I didn't say in. But come to the Garden of God to be taught about those two people that are in the center of it, Christ and what we know today as the Antichrist. You say, well, you're reading a lot into this. This is what I've been given by our Father. This is what I've been given by our Father to give to you for understanding that the temple, you, you think of the temple of, of, of that, that uh, Solomon built. Let me tell you something. The temple was on this planet long before what, God, uh, what Solomon created in stone. The temple, you said, well, yeah, it was with David in the, in the tent. It was long before then. <coughs> the garden of God was God's temple. And he wanted his children to know about him. So this is the beginning. This is the true beginning of the true church of God. There's no name to it because there's no name needed other than God. Why do you think Adam was attacked and Eve, which we'll get to next week? We haven't even got to Eve yet, who's called the mother of all living, which we'll get into next week. So, and the Lord, verse 15, And the Lord God took the man, the man Adam, 
and put him into the garden of Eden, which is the garden of God, to dress it and to keep it, to prepare it for mankind. Verse 16. I'm going to read verse 16 and verse 17 together, and we'll conclude today with this. And the Lord God commanded the man, not mankind, but commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden, Thou mayest freely eat, partake of. But, verse 17 says, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. And we're going to get into this word eat next week. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, God's not telling them, hey, you go over and you pick this, this fruit off this tree and it's bad for you and it'll kill you. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a particular individual, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is Satan himself. And, and God knew that once Adam started messing around with Satan, him being the man Adam, a righteous person, would lose that righteousness. He would lose all that God breathed into him. In other words, if Adam, the man Adam, wouldn't listen to God and follow God's ways, he would be just like the other six-day creation that was living without God. And that would cease him from having life eternal. Partaking of evil <coughs> will cause one to sin. And the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. And without repentance, through that tree of life, being Christ, you will face your end of existence. But having that tree of life, eating of, meaning partaking of that tree of life, being Jesus, you will have life eternal. The choice has always been there for you. From the very beginning. But if you don't understand that beginning, how are you going to understand the ending? Don't miss the next lecture. The understanding of the mother of all living is going to be coming into the picture. And something happened to cause that garden of God to be removed from not only the man Adam, but from all of mankind and what had to take place to bring it back. Hope you enjoyed this lecture. Please join me in prayer. Dear, uh, first of all, uh, any questions? What's been covered? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of today. We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. We thank you for your word, Father, that is so bringing out the clarity of, of just why things have happened the way they have. And it, it, it makes so much more sense to us now that why Satan was placed there. But he wasn't placed there alone. Jesus was there as well to give mankind a choice. You have always given us a choice in these flesh existence. And we thank you for that, Father. I pray for everyone here and their families and all those on YouTube and their families that you watch over all of us. Lead us, guide us, and direct us. And forevermore we will continually give you all glory, honor, and praise. For we do love you with all our hearts with all our minds, with all our strengths, and with all our souls. In Yahshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory.